picture, which is nice. I will begin in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come here this night to discuss human action, the morality of human acts, we ask that you give us an open heart and an open mind so that we may come to find out why it is that you teach what you teach and that your church teaches what it teaches. We just pray, Lord, that you guide our minds, that you give us, above all things this night, wisdom. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My presentation tonight will be perhaps shorter than Robbie's. Um, maybe. Maybe. But um, I thought that was nice. It was an interesting thing last week, right, with the whole second half of church history. I mean, it's terribly unfair. Well, in history in general, right? I used to be a history teacher, and I would have students who would get really, really excited about one event. And as you probably know, there are history professors, there are historians who could focus upon an entire lifetime, they could focus upon one battle. It would be the Battle of Gettysburg or the Battle of the Bulge or whatever it might be. And they could spend an entire life studying that one battle in great, great detail. Well, what we asked our instructors to do, both Wally and Robbie, is to cover the entire 2,000 year history of the church in about two and a half hours. And that's a difficult thing to do. If you were to gain anything from last week's presentation, I would think it would be this. God guides the church, sometimes even in spite of ourselves. There's the old joke about a, a guy in one of those eras in which the church in Rome seemed to be just the biggest of messes. And he said to his priest, as he was in northern France, he says, I think that I want to become Catholic. And his priest said, interesting, well. And, and the man said, in, in fact, I'm going to be going to Rome here in about nine months. It would be wonderful for me to be Catholic on my way to Rome. And the priest said, you know what? Why don't you just wait until after why don't you just wait until after you get back from Rome, and then we can talk about it. The priest being quite sure that the Roman experience and all of the disaster of the leadership and, and even the sinfulness at times of the leadership, he was quite sure that the man would come back not wanting to become Catholic. Well, the, can, the man came back and he was even more excited to be Catholic than he had been in the past. And the priest said, I don't get it. Did you, did you experience the church? Did you, did you meet some of the leaders of the church? And he said, oh, I experienced it. Very much so. And I met many of the leaders, many of the leaders. He says, and you still want to be Catholic? He said, oh, absolutely. He said, if a church can last hundreds and hundreds of years with those buffoons in charge, I know that it's of God. I know that it's of God. And so sometimes... Even in spite of ourselves, the church carries on. Well, that was the promise that was given to Peter and to the apostles. Even the Peter and the apostles were sinful men, as we know. As we know. And it started with sinful men. One who was chosen and still denied Jesus. Another who betrayed Jesus. Others who doubted frequently. And the church carries on. And so praise God for that. Praise God for that witness. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today is morality. And so when we're talking morality, what are we talking about? We're talking about human actions. Humans are free creatures. So humans are, are different than animals. For, humans have an intellect and a will. We have the ability to choose. We're not just based on instinct. We don't just act on instinct. 
as do animals. And so we have the ability to reason. We have the ability to contemplate. I always like to say that we have the ability to ponder things. As humans, we can even ponder the fact that we are pondering. Think about that. I can ponder the fact that I can ponder. Well, you're not going to see that in the animals, but because we have the freedom to choose this or that, we also now have a responsibility that is put in accordance with that choice. And we see that choices can be good, they can be neutral, or they can be evil. And so morality is ultimately the study, or that which has to do with the goodness or the evil of human acts. Freedom makes us a moral subject. We must look at a number of things when we look at whether or not something is evil. And it has to be good on all three of these accounts. It has to be a good nature. The nature of the action has to be good. It can't be an evil action. Uh, secondly, it has to be a good intention. And thirdly, the circumstances surrounding it also need to be good. Okay, if it's going to be a moral act. Now, you can study that and get into it very deeply. You can talk about it on many levels, and you can ask many questions with many scenarios. But in the end, it can't be a forbidden act. It can't be for forbidden intentions or uh, circumstances. It, can't, it must be good. The church takes the lead in teaching human morality. And this is going to be an important point for us to make. The church doesn't make it good. It's something doesn't become good just because the church teaches it. All right? An act doesn't become a good act only because the church teaches it. The church in its wisdom, guided by the Holy Spirit, teaches it because it is a good act. Because it was ordained by God to be a good act. This is the way you should act like this and not like that. And the church, in its guidance and its inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will be able to then discern the goodness or the evil of an action and tell you, yes, this is something that should be done, but this is something that should not be done. That was something that was ingrained into our schools. That never, ever, ever is it appropriate or, or right to simply say, well, why, why is that? Why is that the way we're supposed to do things? Never is it a good answer to say, well, that's what the church says. The church saying it doesn't make it right. It being right is what makes it right. The church guided by the Holy Spirit then teaches it. The first thing is that it simply is right. You will see there are a couple different ways in which we judge and base morality, both coming down from the divine law. We have the Ten Commandments, which are gained all the way back in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments kind of set the boundaries. These are the thou shalt nots. Obviously, if you can live within those boundaries, you have the opportunity to be a good person. Just because you haven't murdered anybody doesn't necessarily make you a good person, however. And then the other standard would be the Beatitudes. The blessed are they, blessed are the, the, the sorrowful, blessed are the meek, blessed are the all the different blesseds that you'll see in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, given to us by Jesus, and, and you can find them in, in Matthew. You can find them, obviously, as well in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, on this one topic we're covering tonight, spends about one-fourth of its entire section on morality and human action. Um, and so, obviously, this is a big and a broad topic. But, in the end, these laws, these rules, this rightness that is passed down to us from God, this goodness of human actions, they bring us to a deeper sense of freedom, a more impressive sense of freedom. And it's kind of like this. We are free in one way to do what we want. We are free to do what we want. But if we do what we ought, if we do what we ought, then we discover a more profound and beautiful style of freedom. And this is the analogy that I've probably been using for years now, maybe even over a decade. 
but we think of the, the highway. Maybe I've even spoken to this to you in RCIA because I speak about it frequently. We think about the highway. In fact, I know I spoke to you about it because I was getting ready to leave. I think RCIA, no, 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 that was a different class. I apologize. The highway has many laws. Some would say that those laws restrict my freedom. Okay, very good. Yet, I would argue that those laws, which restrict my ability to do whatever I want to do, actually bring me more freedom. Let's talk about it like this. Sometimes when you're driving down a busy highway, what do they have to your left? Large concrete barriers. That if you go to the left into oncoming traffic, you'll hit a barrier before you hit oncoming traffic. You could say those barriers, they take away my freedom. Off to the right, what do you have? You have the ditch, but before you hit the ditch, what do you have? You have the little rumble strips or whatever in the, in the, in the highway that goes or however that goes, you know? And when you're not paying attention, all of a sudden your tire hits those strips and you're saying, wait a second, those strips take away my freedom. Maybe I want to drive over there into that ditch at 90 miles an hour. Maybe I want to drive into oncoming traffic at 90 miles an hour, but that's the thing. Without those laws of the road, what would life really be like? Think about it. When I drive down the highway, it's very easy for me to listen to a podcast, if I have friends in the car, to have a conversation with those friends. What's that? to listen to a podcast, to have a conversation with friends, to listen to music. I feel very free and at ease to do those things, and I would imagine that you do as well. Why? Well, because we have things like rumble strips, because we have things like concrete barriers, because we have things like lines that are sometimes dotted, but sometimes, you know, stride lines, sometimes they're, what do you call them? The dotted? Yeah, they're not dotted lines, are they? Dashed? <laughs> what do you call the passing lines? Lines that you can pass them. They're just passing lines. I don't know. Are they dotted? They're not dotted. Good Lord. But they're not solid. I can tell you that much. They're not solid lines. If they're solid, don't go over them. All right. All those laws exist. You know what other laws exist? Laws that say you can't have a picnic in the middle of I-70. Laws that say you can't jump around on your pogo stick down the, down, down the road. Right? Pedestrians not allowed on the interstate. Okay. Again, we can say, look at all the, the ways in which those laws are stealing my freedom. But just imagine a world in which we didn't have those laws. That nobody says you drive on the right side of the road instead of the left. Nobody says that you can't have a picnic in the middle of I-70. Nobody has any idea which way to turn, what to use, how to do the blinkers, stop like... Would you be free at that moment? Would you be free to sing a song, to talk to a friend, or listen to a podcast? No way. You'd be doing what? You'd be living in fear. Your life would be filled with fear. You'd probably be driving about seven miles an hour everywhere you went, just afraid that maybe somebody's going to be having a picnic in the middle of the highway, or some dude on his pogo stick's going to be trying to use the same road that you're using. Laws prevent us from doing certain things, but they provide us the freedom to truly live. And that's the same thing with the moral law. It's the same thing with the moral law. And that's why it's important for us as Catholics to really dive deeply into the moral law and to ask questions, what are they? What are the laws that, that we're to follow? But then secondly, why are we to follow them? Sometimes it's easier to figure those things out than others. Sometimes it's controversial. But I can promise you at the heart of it, the Catholic Church, in all of its wisdom, will not teach something that is not of God. I truly believe that. Okay. So I got Father Ryan, do you want to add anything or should we start watching some videos? Let's start watching some videos.